The scene is set. The cursed pirates know that they need blood from one of Bootstrap Bill's descendants in order to break the curse. They think it's Elizabeth Swan, so they take her over to Isla de Muerta and they cut her hand open and lo and behold, the curse doesn't break. When they finally get a hold of Will Turner, realize who he is, they say, one drop's not going to do it, we're going to spill it all. If you haven't seen Pirates of the Caribbean, I won't spoil the ending for you, but I want to draw this comparison to how St. Thomas Aquinas shares today how there was no need for Jesus to die for our sins to be redeemed. He talks about how if a king is struck in the face, he suffers a greater indignity than does a private person because the indignities and sufferings that anyone suffers are measured according to the dignity of the person concerned. Jesus Christ as an eternal being, as God incarnate, the Son of God, he obviously, anything that he has is going to surpass any level of a typical human, right? He's 100% man, 100% God. The hypostatic union is existing within him. And so St. Bernard had stated that the least drop of the blood of Christ would have sufficed for the redemption of us all. So why did he die altogether? Why did he choose to undergo such suffering? And St. Thomas Aquinas gives three points here where he talks about how um, the price of an item needs to be equivalent and how it's with a death that he he bought us back from death. And so without that, right, it's just a a simple exchange to say, because I'm dying, I'm dying in your place. The second reason he offers is for it to be an example of courage, that men would not be afraid to die for the truth. And then thirdly, he says that the death of Christ might be a sacrament to work our salvation. We, since we are dying to our sin, to our bodily desires, and to our own will through the power of death of Christ. St. Peter had stated in 1 Peter 3 verse 18, Christ also died once for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might offer us to God, being put to death indeed in the flesh, but enlivened in the spirit. So obviously in um, Pirates of the Caribbean, when they realize, oh, we are, you know, okay, spoiler alert at this point, sorry if you haven't seen it, it's how old now. Um, But in Pirates of the Caribbean, they basically get the blood, right? And then they come back to life. And what happens? They immediately die. And there's a part of me that wonders, you know, I mean, obviously this isn't a direct parallel or anything else, but there wasn't a direct price paid first and foremost, right? There wasn't actually a death in order for them to live. But there was blood. Blood is indicative of sacrifice, And if I keep walking into this analogy, it'll probably just all start falling apart for (laughs) what parallels I was seeing within it all. But but as it is, they, they come to life and then they die again. There was no sustaining life within them. And that is what Jesus Christ offers differently for us in the Eucharist, is that he left his body and blood physically tangible in the Catholic faith. It it sits, the priests consecrate the host, they consecrate the wine, transubstantiation takes place, which is where it actually converts and is transformed into the body and blood of Christ. And so he's left his blood so that it can sustain life within us. The cursed pirates didn't have that luxury. They didn't get to live. They didn't get to experience life. Uh, Captain Barbosa, he never got his bite of his apple. But it's not the same with Christ. Christ is just sitting there like he's underwent the suffering. He didn't just get, you know, scourged once with a single, you know, slap on his wrist, whatever, a single whip and there's the blood and the blood has been offered and it's done. No, it wasn't that way in the Old Testament either. You had to kill the lamb and then you were not permitted to eat that meat. You were not permitted. You you didn't drink the blood of any animal which has its own, I I did a whole video on the Jewish roots of the Eucharist. You can look up uh, Dr. Brent Petre anytime and and look at the Jewish roots of the Eucharist to get a better feel for what 
implications the Old Testament sacrifice had in relation to Christ. But as it is, we have the blood of Christ available to us. Um, hopefully soon, again, obviously most parishes in my area are still only offering the body of Christ because when COVID came around, they took away the cup of wine, which I am waiting to return. It's like, when will this be, right? And um, and so I don't know, but but we have this connection with Christ that has remained on earth with us, that he wants to sustain us, and he has he he paid the price for us. He he physically died in our place so that we do not have to physically die. We die to ourselves instead, we our our wills, our desires that are not in line with his. Um but, but ultimately, then it is through death to self that we are alive in him. And I, I talk about, I've talked about a few times here recently how that's the paradox of the gospel, that it's through death we will experience life. And so I just, I, I wanted to share that today because I did watch The Curse of the Black Pearl again here recently. And just reading that, just understanding, oh, wow, it could have only taken a couple drops of blood. He went through something so much more significant you know, for multiple purposes, whether that be that example of courage, whether that be the price for price, whether that be whatever the fullness of intentions are there, um, it wasn't entirely all completely necessary, right? He, he did it out of respect for us because of the dignity that he views within us, and he did it because he loves us. He did it because he loves you. He did it because he loves me. He did it because he wants us to be with him. And so, um, yeah, I just, I don't know. That's really all that I have for you today. I did share on Patreon that I will be only doing videos um, without my face here on YouTube. Um, it will only be the podcast, which if you listen to my podcast on whatever streaming platform, wonderful, because that's what I prefer. But you might notice a slight shift in style today felt different, but, um, I feel like since I'm not looking at myself in a camera as I'm talking, that maybe as the rest of Lent progresses, it might feel more like a conversation to me because when I'm speaking to the camera, it's obviously a little less <laughs> like a typical conversation because I can see my reflection and I'm basically talking to it. So I'm wondering how it'll impact um, the conversation level, right? Because I do want this to be a conversation. I felt like I was telling a story to start and it felt very formal, which is not incredibly my style. So, um, so I have to find this balance of how do I hook the audience and also... I don't want an audience. I just want to talk to you. And so how do I balance that with wanting to be interesting to you and wanting you to stick around um, while still, you know, yeah, being interesting and not being a boring person who just goes on and on like I am right now because a girl can ramble. I can. So that's today. That is what it is. And um, yeah, so I look forward to chatting with you then again tomorrow. I hope that the third week of Lent is going well for you. And I'm looking forward to all of it. Talking about the preaching of the Samaritan woman should be good. All right. Take care. God bless. Talk to you soon.